Hello again, fellow soldiers, and welcome back to another edition of Appropriating the Culture. On the docket today, we tackle the issue of hypocrisy. How does our culture view hypocrisy? Is it a particularly prevalent vice of religious communities? And if so, why? So let's get all Batman on our two-face, more set our Mr. Duplicity, and join me for a riveting discussion on saying one thing and doing another. I'm Pastor Shane, and I'll be your Pharisee today as we appropriate some culture. <laughs> One of the most common charges against Christians is that Christians are nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. And that's an accusation that cuts particularly deep because that's the exact label that Jesus threw around when he was dealing with the religious leaders of his day. Matthew, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Luke, Beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Back to Matthew. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received the reward in full. You hypocrites! Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. So Jesus spoke out forcefully against hypocrisy, and it is a serious issue. But because Jesus was so vocal about it, I think we tend to create a false hierarchy of sin in which we regard hypocrisy as a greater sin than the others. And our culture has in many ways latched onto that. Norm MacDonald passed away recently, and so there were a lot of clips of him circling the internet. Here's a favorite of mine. Now, do you think uh, Cosby's uh, legacy uh, will be hurt? Yeah. You do, huh? I mean, there was a comedian, Patton Oswalt, he told me, I think the worst part of the Cosby thing was the hypocrisy. And I disagreed. You disagree with that? Yeah. I thought it was the raping. <laughs> As my feeling, most rapists are hypocrites. You don't meet many go, I like raping, and I, I know it's not politically correct, but by God, People go, well, he's not being a hypocrite, and that's the worst part. <laughs> Fair point, right? But that sentiment of Patton Oswalt that hypocrisy is the worst part was the view of our culture for a long time. All other sins are lesser sins. You know, I might be a this, I might be a that, but at least I'm not a hypocrite. And we see this too with our culture's emphasis on authenticity, right? Better to be authentic than two-faced. And people use that to justify saying whatever comes into their heads and living life without any filter because they're just being them. But the problem with that is our authentic selves are jerks. Our authentic selves are terrible. You know, Adam Carolla had a joke about this that you can always tell that someone is a terrible person when people describe them by their name. You know, John is... Uh, John is John, you know? He is who he is, which is, he's a jerk. And we're all jerks, at least at some moments. And the better thing in those moments is not to be authentic because we don't want to be hypocrites. The better thing is to suppress your authentic self and pretend that you're not the way you really are. You know, the Christian walk is about putting off our old selves and putting on Christ. Furthermore, the notion of hypocrisy as the worst sin has led our culture to all sorts of looniness. You know, so repugnant was the sin of hypocrisy, so despicable, so foul, so contemptible a vice, that to avoid it, we abandoned all virtue. Which has a sort of twisted logic to it. You can't fall short of your standards if you don't have any. And that's not really even hyperbole. You know, John H. Richardson, writing in Esquire, said this, I want to suggest that sex, be it adulterous or premarital or deviant or polyamorous, is a good thing, not a bad thing. 
and that sex itself is the moment of grace, and that our sterile idea of perfection is the actual sin. To start with the subject on the table, adultery is a brave rebellion against the invisible prison we build for ourselves. It is not our sex, but our hypocrisy that is the annihilator of marriage and destroyer of lives and reputations. Marriage invites adultery, the uniform invites war, a rage for order always invites destruction. See, not only is hypocrisy the worst sin, it's actually the only sin. Adultery? Fine. It's your sterile idea of perfection that's the problem. And there's many in our culture that have deluded themselves into thinking that they are somehow more moral simply by holding lower standards. That's not the Christian understanding. We're not bettered by lowering our standards. You know, Jesus said, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's what we're aiming at. That's what we're aspiring to. And yes, all of us are going to fall short, especially Tom Brady. But that doesn't mean we do away with the standards just to avoid being hypocrites. We are hypocrites. We're all hypocrites in some way, shape, or form. We all say one thing and sometimes do the other. And we should admit that. We should admit our failures and our shortcomings. But that we profess the Christian ideal and aspire to be something better than we are is not to our shame. You know, G.K. Chesterton said, The Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. Let's be people who try even if we fail. Now, the interesting thing is recently, I've been seeing a shift in our culture's tolerance for hypocrisy. There's certainly been no shortage of hypocrisy in recent days. Uh, Gavin Newsom gave a stay-at-home order and then went out to a party at the French Laundry. Mayor Lightfoot shut down hair salons due to COVID, but went and got herself a haircut. The mayor of San Francisco violated her own health orders and was seen maskless at a nightclub because, quote, she was feeling the spirit. Al Gore and John Kerry have been preaching about the doom of climate change while hobnobbing around on private jets. But the charge of hypocrisy doesn't seem to quite be landing with the same force because I think our culture is reinstating a moral order and is increasingly religious, though certainly not Christian. That is, we have an ideal. And we're more tolerant of hypocrisy because we see the value of the ideal. Occasionally slipping up and not wearing your mask is better than having no mask mandate. So hypocrisy becomes a lesser sin. And if you sin, St. Dr. Fauci is merciful. There's literally prayer candles. If you expend a lot of carbon in pursuit of reducing carbon emissions, that is still better than denying the coming apocalypse as outlined in the special revelation of the climate models. So hypocrisy becomes a lesser sin. Religious people are more likely to be hypocritical precisely because they profess a creed and a doctrine and make moral claims. When you put forth an ideal or a standard, you're going to fall short of it sometimes. That's human nature. And that's true whether you're trying to follow the God of the Bible or if you're trying to live your life in service to Gaia. But that doesn't mean that hypocrisy is okay. You know, we hate it in other people. We should hate it in ourselves as well. Now, one of the other reasons that Christians are particularly susceptible to hypocrisy, I think is well articulated in an article I read by Jason Bradley in Relevant Magazine. He says this, I'm not much of a drinker, but I do enjoy an occasional adult beverage. Uh, one year, I made the mistake of commemorating an exceptional pumpkin ale with an Instagram Facebook post. A couple of weeks later, I found myself having a conversation with a dear woman who felt the need to share her disappointment with me. I lead worship in a Nazarene church, and although the denomination has made huge strides in its philosophy and practice, it has a strong holiness background. Not too many decades ago, you couldn't be a member in good standing and dance, play cards, or see a movie. This woman, who was brought up by a strict holiness pastor, saw my beer and was instantly trying to figure out if I needed to be relieved of my church responsibilities. Even though this conversation had a positive outcome, I found myself thinking carefully about what I posted, worrying that things I was comfortable with would be used to incriminate me. While the threat of disapproval may get us to change or hide our behavior, it doesn't change our beliefs. It simply drives them underground. This woman's strong and negative reaction to my beer didn't change how I felt about pumpkin ale. It just made me question how forthright I could be about who I am and how much I could trust my community. This is always the outcome of behavioral watchdogs. I know many people raised in holiness churches would load their kids up and take them three towns over to see a forbidden movie so that no one in their church would find out. 
The message that gets reinforced is that if people are going to get upset at you, just hide it. It greatly undermined the ability for the children in those families to be honest in churches when they grew up. While this kind of suppressive behavior starts because we want to avoid the hassle of nosy, judgmental Christians, it eventually paves the way for abuse. Once we learn to avoid problems by compartmentalizing areas of our lives, we become way too comfortable with duplicity. Yeah, we need to live like Jesus. You know, Jesus didn't lower the standards to live a righteous life. You know, he lived a perfectly righteous life, but he also lived it in the culture, not shying away from things like eating with tax collectors and sinners, even though he was judged for it. And that takes a strong fortitude. And it's a big reason why we emphasize not judging one another in regards to disputable matters here. It's hard enough to keep the moral law. We don't need pharisaical laws on top of it. Jesus condemned that. And Christ is the self that we're trying to take on. We come up short of that sometimes. We should admit that. We should all be open about that. But we don't become more moral by lowering our standards. As C.S. Lewis said, aim at heaven and you'll get the earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you'll get neither. Well, that's it for this week. Like, share, subscribe, give five-star reviews, whatever it takes. If you like what we're doing here, spread the word, and I'll see you next week for more Appropriate in the Culture. Mm -hmm.